Father, we come before you today. We've come to bless you. We've come to lift your name on high. There's no one like you, our God. You are King. You are Father. You are Lord. You are friend. We worship you today. Wherever you are, lift your hands and give him praise. Wherever you are, begin to think of who he is and lift him up. Blessed be your name, God. We adore you. Oh, 
Give thanks to our God. 
Good morning and welcome to the Covenant Nation. My name is Omolara Williams and I'm delighted to welcome you to church today. We trust that you've been following the word that's been coming forth from our church to you. If you haven't, please go to our um, archives at elibrary.insightforliving.org and you can have access to all of the messages that have been preached at the Covenant Nation. This morning, I'm going to hand you over to our senior pastor, Pastor Pojo Imari. But before then, please invite somebody to join us for church today. Send them the link, whatever platform you run. You can share that with them. But we're on on our YouTube channel. We're on on Facebook, on Twitter. And if you go to our website and click on the live stream tab, you can access access our video and audio live stream. Now it's time to have church, put away all distractions, get your writing material and get ready to receive the word. Welcome to church. Welcome this morning and thank you very much for allowing us into your private spaces wherever you are. It's always an honor and privilege to be able to speak uh, to God's people. Um, before going into the, the message this morning, I would just like to take our confession of faith. Why do we do this? We do this to stir up the Holy Spirit on the inside of us and to release that anointing into our souls so that when our eyes make contact with the scriptures or our ears pick up on the words that are spoken in hearing, we will hear and in seeing, we will see. So let's start one to go. As I sit to listen to the word of God today, a door of utterance has been opened unto us, and I hear the voice of God clearly speaking to me. This is the way to go, walk ye in it. I listen under the influence of the Spirit of God, and I am not distracted by anything or anyone. The word of God is food to my spirit, I am strengthened by it this morning. It is wine to my heart, creating joy within me. It is oil to my face, causing my life to shine, giving me victory in everything that I do. As my eyes make contact with the scriptures used in this message, the Spirit of God opens new things unto me. He also brings to my remembrance things that Jesus once showed me. I come to understand God's system on the earth, and I receive instruction, encouragement, correction, and the enablement to live God's will. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I want to share on something that is really important in scriptures, and it will be very helpful to all of us um, as we go into it. And the title of this message is, What Most Hinders Life? What is the very thing that hinders life the most? And what most liberates it? What hinders life the most? And what liberates life the most? And we're going to start from Matthew chapter 18. And I read from verse 23 um, right to, to verse 35. Uh, we all know this parable. Uh, it says... Um, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? All right, till seven times. And Jesus said, I say unto thee, until seven times, but not until seven times, but until seventy times seven. And then he went on and said, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king which will take account of his, his servants. And so when Jesus said, this is how we can liken the kingdom of God, what he's telling us are three things. Number one, in this parable, you will understand how God rules and reigns. What it means to be under the lordship and the rulership of God how his kingdom functions. The second thing is, you will understand how God intended for us to live our lives here upon the earth. So we come to understand how God intends for us to live our lives on the earth and the dynamics of God 
within our human relationships. How we intended for life to function. And then the third, we'll find out how we can align ourselves with him. His intended order so that we find joy in seeing our lives becoming every single thing that they are supposed to be. So, we'll, three things. We understand how God rules. We understand how God intended for us to live our lives on this earth. And how we align ourselves with his intended plan and purpose. So that we will find joy. Because our lives also will evolve into the way and manner in which God intended it to be. So we're looking here at Matthew chapter 18 here. And he says, therefore, verse 23, is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king that will take account of his servants. And when he began to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, for the Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, his children, and all that he had, and payment shall be made. And then the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, I will pay thee all. And then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But then the same servant went out, found one of his fellow servants, which who owed him one hundred pence, and he laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that which thou owest. And this fellow servant fell down at his feet, besought him, saying, Have patience with me. I will pay thee all. And he will not, he didn't agree, but went and cast him into prison till he shall pay all the debt. So when the fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou did desire. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had had pity on thee? And the Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do unto you, if you from your hearts do not forgive every one of his brother their trespasses. So shall my Father do unto you, if you do not. Now we're going to look at this in the course of the message, and we'll find out that this parable he gave here, this illustration, is at the bedrock of answers to prayers. And if there's anything we do as human beings to God, we offer up prayers and we seek for his divine intervention in the scheme of things. Every single person under the sound of my voice must have something in their heart, regardless of your belief system, regardless of your religion. There's something in your heart. You want God Almighty in heaven to step into the affairs of your life now and to intervene on that particular thing and bring favor towards you in a particular direction. You want the creator of all things to lean towards you in that direction and intervene in your affairs. And Jesus said this is the great hindrance to that intervention. He says, when you stand praying, forgive. For if you do not forgive, your Father in heaven will not be able to forgive you of your own trespasses. And he says here, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not everyone, all right, his brother, their trespasses. So here we have the fundamentals of effective, the fundamentals of functional and successful living right inside this illustration that Jesus gave. And the crux of the matter is, we find it, and it says here in verse 
33. Shouldest not thou also had had compassion on thy fellow servant even as I had pity upon you. The whole crux of the message is should you not have had compassion upon others even as I had compassion upon you. Let me repeat it again so it sinks down. The whole crux here is should you not have had compassion upon your brothers and the people you are interacting with even as I have had compassion upon you. What Jesus desires is that we extend the compassion he has extended to us. We extend it to other people. Let me tell you a story here that comes to mind before we get back to this. I think that the deputy, if I'm correct, but he is a sitting judge on the Supreme Court of South Africa. I think he's the deputy president of that court. But I stand to be corrected on that. But when he was going through um, and he met with the parliament to ratify the appointment, he was asked to tell a story of his life. And this has to do with this fundamental thing. That even as God had had compassion on you, that you have compassion on others. That the new commandment is that you love even as I have loved you. And this young man said when he was young, his father died early. And so his mother struggled, all right, to get them through. And his mother was ill. Her health broke down. So he had to go out to work at a very early age to get things together to take care of his mother and to take care of his other younger siblings. And he used to do that every day and read and study. And then he got admission to go and read law. And this was a, a great opportunity for him. But he had a problem. His mother was now ill and she couldn't go out to work. He had become the breadwinner of the family and he was going to go and have his education. So who was going to work and take care of his mother and his siblings? So one day an idea came to him and he walked into the shop of an Indian man who was quite successful in the place. And he told the Indian man, I am going to law school and showed him his admission and said, but I need help. My mother is ill at home. I just need you because he owned a grocery store or you call a big supermarket where they sold a lot of food stuff. Please could you every week help to deliver food to my mother so she could take care of herself, at least be able to eat and the family. When I'm through with law school and I become a practicing lawyer, I will pay back everything that you have given to my family. All right, the Indian man said, I'll do that for you. And said, here's the voucher you give your mother. She can send somebody to the shop every week based on this voucher that has the amount. They can take as much from the supermarket they need for their sustenance according to this. At the end of your career, of your sorry, at the end of your schooling, and you start working, in three years, I will have all the vouchers, will calculate the amount, and you pay me back instrumentally. And he agreed and said thank you. The Indian merchant kept faithfully to his word. And they delivered groceries and stuff for his mother and family. And they were sustained for those three years. And he said when he finished school, he went back to go and see this Indian man years ago, decades ago. And he walked into his shop and said, I've finished now. How much do I owe you and how? So that we come to an agreement as to how I will pay. When he got to that point in the hearing there, he broke into tears and could not hold himself. And the judge of the Supreme Court of South Africa was there. He said, continue the story. 
He said, when I got in and told him, I'm now a lawyer. He said to him, you kept your word. I'll tell you what you will do. All of these vouchers, he said, we cut them up. You only do one thing for me. Don't pay me back. But what I have done to you, you'll find two or three people, young South Africans, and do the same unto them. That's all I ask of you. This is the basis of what God is telling us. He said, the same way I showed you compassion, I'm asking you that you go out and show compassion to others as I've shown you. Now, here's the point. The reason why we do not show compassion, I'm going somewhere, as much as we ought to, is that we don't understand what it means when the Bible says God has forgiven us. We don't understand the power of what happened. We can't, you know, because we don't feel it and nothing, say, well, you forgive, forgive. Well, all right, God has forgiven us. And we don't really appreciate the depth of it. So let me bring it into this earthly realm so we understand the power of what God did in showing us compassion and forgiving us. Because to build a life on the foundation of forgiveness, we first of all must drink of the fountain of God's own forgiveness. In other words, anybody who will work in forgiveness, it's because you drink of the fountain of God's forgiveness. Now, I'll tell another story, this one from the scriptures, so we understand the importance of it. Remember when Jesus came to the earth, he saw a man sick of palsy, and that man was right on the bed. And he said, son of man, I told him, he said, your sins are forgiven. And all the Pharisees there say, now who gave you the power? He said, I'm saying it so you know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins. He said, I could have said to him, arise, take up your bed and work. But I chose to say, your sins are forgiven. So you will understand I have the power to forgive sins on the earth. So he told him, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing comes upon you. The man got up from the bed and left. In other words, forgiving that man of his sins brought about the man who was paralyzed lying there. Forgiving him brought about a complete restoration of his health. And the man stood up straight and walked away. Now, that kind of person, if you ask him to forgive because he appreciates and understands. That's why I told the story that I experienced forgiveness. I was bound to a bed. And I experience the mercy of God. Now uh, he knows what it means. And he goes out. And he's able to show that. Because it's quantifiable to him. That judge in South Africa will find it easy now. At least the concept of showing compassion. Because he has experienced compassion. Now in this story, it was the story of the Gibeonites. And the first encounter with the Gibeonites was with Joshua. And what had happened was uh, the nation of Israel and that Joshua were conquering all forms of nations. So the Gibeonites came up with this fantastic strategy in their own minds. And it was a strategy that they were going to come into allegiance and alliance with the nation of Israel. But they were deceptive about it for their own personal security. So what they did was that they took bread, they let it stay stale, it had molds on it, they put their, their shoes in, in, in sand, they put it in mud and, and did all kinds of and brought old clothes. And so they came to come and meet the nation of Israel, um, Joshua, and they said, Joshua, you know, we've come from a far country, we have been suffering and all of this. All we just want is for you to come into an agreement with us and, you know, that you will protect us and all of that. And the Bible says Joshua did not take counsel from God. And based on what they saw with their eyes, they made their decision that these folks come from a very far country. They didn't know it was one of the places God had asked them to go and conquer. So they didn't take counsel from God. And we always make mistakes when we judge by the sight of our eyes or hearing of our ears without offering up prayer unto God. Let me repeat that. We always make major mistakes when we don't 
or when we judge by the sight of our eyes or hearing of our ears and we don't take counsel from God. So they decided to come into agreement with them and the covenant was sealed. Now, so what happens? Three days after, they discovered that they had been deceived. So the leaders of Israel, the princes there, told Joshua, break this covenant and go and deal with these folks. Joshua said, if we tamper with this covenant, the wrath of God will come upon us, for we have come into an agreement with these people, and we cannot break this agreement. The wrath of God will come upon us, and this will affect us going forward. The best we can do is that we'll make them fetchers of water and hewers of wood. So they decided to do that. And they became fetchers of water and hewers of wood. They looked at the covenant, the agreement. They said, well, we can make them our slaves and servants. So it means in society, they will be the one fetching water. They were servants there. So the Gibeonites were the servants, the maids, all right, all those things for the nation of Israel. But they were under the protection of Israel. 300 years later, I'm going to read a story to you. David had experienced a season in the nation of Israel where rain had not fallen for about, all right, three years. And so David goes up to God in 2 Samuel chapter 21 and says unto God, why has there been no rain? Now, see what happened. There was famine during David's reign that lasted year after year for three years. And David spent much time praying about it, 2 Samuel chapter 1. Verse 1 from the Living Bible. Then the Lord said, The famine is because of the guilt of Saul and his family, for they murdered the Gibeonites. Now, Saul was sort of a reckless man. So he did not, from generation to generation, they had always warned them, We have an agreement with the Gibeonites, don't touch them. Saul broke the agreement and at one point killed all the Gibeonites. Okay? And so, God told David, he broke a covenant. He killed the Gibeonites and spilled their blood. This is why there is no rain. Now, so what had the Gibeonites done with their spirits and their words? They had kept rain away from the nation of Israel that had a covenant with God for the space of three years. You think about that. If you go to this story, please follow me. You will see the root of witchcraft and how to deal with it. Because in our interaction one with another, if we don't understand these dynamics, people may be, parents may be out of anger, making pronouncements. Spouses may be saying things, not understanding the spiritual implication of what they are saying. Friends, where their social contract may be making utterances, not understanding the spiritual significance. And you as a person upon the earth must know how to keep yourself free, all right, of such things within your life. Now, let me show you what happened here. In this Bible here, we know of the man whom, what Jesus was saying here, when his fellow servants did him wrong, the Bible says he took him by the throat, saying, Me pay all that he had. And the Bible says, And he will not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. Note something. At the end of this parable, we find people reporting that man who threw his colleague into prison. And then God said, We are going to judge you for you throwing him into prison. Tormentors will come into your life. But nobody said anything about the man that was in prison. What happened to him? What happened to the chap that was in prison? He was left there in prison. Now what happened was, in the dynamics of us relating with one another, people can, all right, go and, and, and hurt and harm people, other people's lives, and imprison them. So here, the Gibeonites had refused to forgive the nation of Israel. 
and they had made a demand just like this fellow servant refused to forgive his friend and made a demand upon his life and said you are going to be imprisoned until that debt is paid and i'm satisfied i have seen upon your life the full consequences of the wrongdoing that you did upon me and my heart is satisfied at that point you can let go when Peter was in prison and he, they prayed without season, he said, God has delivered me from the hands of Herod and the expectation of the Jews. The Jews wanted him dead. So, what happened? David said, this is relationship now, not between Israel and God. It wasn't because they did something against God, it's because they offended the Gibeonites. Saul offended the Gibeonites. So God told David, go and meet the Gibeonites and ask the Gibeonites what they want in return to release you so that rain can fall from heaven. Think about this. God says, you go and meet the Gibeonites. It's a dynamic of human relationship. And we don't understand the dynamics of this. So David asked them, what can I do for you to rid ourselves of this guilt? To induce you to ask God to bless us. The Gibeonites said, well, money won't do it. We don't want to see Israelites executed in revenge. What can I do then? David asked, just tell me and I will do it for you. And the Gibeonites said, well, then they replied, give us seven of Saul's sons, the sons of the man who did his best to destroy us. And we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeon, the city of the king of Saul. Seven sons of Saul. Once we hang them, you go and read it, rain will begin to fall. They gave them seven sons of Saul. They hung them, rain started falling. Rain began to fall. So, if we remove Jesus out of the equation, what Jesus did for you and the sacrifice as the ransom he paid in full. This is what will happen. Any person you offend, any person you've done something wrong to, any person you trespass, any person you hurt, they will make pronouncements according to the pain that they have felt in their hearts. And those pronouncements shall remain until you can come and pacify them with whatever they demand. Man will have been living in perpetual bondage one to another. Where what will have had was witchcraft on steroids. As men make pronouncements on other people. Because of the hurt and the pain that they caused them. Jesus came and the father said, I released you from the consequence of everything you have done on this earth. And set you free. All I said to you was that this covering will remain on you. So long as you as a person. When somebody else does you that kind of evil or trespasses, forgive that person. Show the same compassion. When you do that, he says, I will be able to forgive you of all your own trespasses. I can intervene. That's why he says, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. God looks upon the earth and says, you can't make a legitimate demand because this person also has been deeply offended by others and he has walked in the law of mercy so mercy can speak over his life, not judgment. Judge not and you will not. Condemn not and nobody will be able to condemn you. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it shall be given. Shall men give to your bosom? In other words, if you forgive, you, if you judge, you get judgment. 
If you condemn, you get that condemnation. If you forgive from your heart, then that also can happen for you in your own life. So God came to relieve us of the consequence of having damaged lives where weapons, words that are weaponized against you, where no, no weapons formed and fashioned against you will prosper. He came to set the lawful captive. Lawful captive. It tells us in the book of Isaiah. Lawful captive, Isaiah 49, free, and the prey of the mighty. That's one that had been taken prey by the strong, which means you are held captive lawfully based on what you did. He set you free from all of that. And all he says is, when other people offend you, which is a fraction of everything that you have done, let them go. This is what he's saying here. Now God says this, and this is what he showed me. He says, I can forgive people of everything and intervene in their life. But the one thing that you do that can stay the hand of God from being able to show you mercy is when you walk in that sin of unforgiveness. Think about it. God, Jesus said, forgive so that your Father who is in heaven can forgive you of your trespasses, which means if there's unforgiveness, the Father can't forgive you of walking in unforgiveness. Do you get it? But when you forgive, then you open up the door for his mercy to come into your life. So what most hinders life is unforgiveness. Let me repeat that. What most hinders life is unforgiveness. What most liberates life is forgiveness. What opens up doors is unforgiveness. What hinders an individual is unforgiveness. Psalm 103 from verses 2 will say something here about God. Just look at what God does. Psalm 103 and verse 2. Very powerful. It tells us, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his what benefits. What's the first benefit of God? Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. So that, next one, who healeth all thy disease. Once, he says, once I can come in and forgive, the first benefit of God to a human soul is forgiveness. Let me say it again. The first benefit of God to a human soul is forgiveness. Mercy. That's why he says he has, tr he has delivered us from the power of darkness and transplanted us into the kingdom of his dear son. How did he do it? In whom we have what? Forgiveness. First thing in the kingdom. That's how he delivers from the power of darkness. By forgiving. That's how pronouncements from the kingdom of darkness can hold. Because, you have, because of his forgiveness. Now, if we hinder him from forgiving us in our work, he said, I can forgive you of everything, but what hinders me from forgiving you is if you do not show that same thing to your own brother after I did it for you the first time. Can you imagine that judge now seeing somebody in need, saying, get out of my office. Somebody walks up to him and says, I'm a young man. I just got admission into the medical school and he says, get out. He says, who healeth of all that diseases? Who redeemeth thy life from destruction? Which means God can now go in and heal. God's hand can go in now and redeem your life from all forms of destruction and crown you with loving kindness and tender mercy. Satisfy your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed as the eagles. He can do all of that because he can come in first through that door of forgiveness. Also, the door through which God comes into our lives to do something new and fresh and powerful is when he gives us the opportunity to forgive. When we walk in on forgiveness, that's the door also, we said this last week, through which Satan can come in with all his demonic spirits 
to do stuff within the person's life. For we saw there, he said, when that man refused to forgive, then God says, the door has now been opened up to torment us. So God says, for him to be able to keep us safe, away from the expectations, the pronouncements of men, weapons formed or fashioned against you, is make sure inside your heart. And we die daily. We take up that cross and die daily. What does that mean? People rob us of wrongly. I mean, why do you think the Bible says a man's enemies are those of his house, especially those of his household? What he's saying is people that are very close to you are the people you likely have offended the most because they bear the brunt of your character defect. If you are a person who is short-tempered, it's not somebody far away that will be seeing the effect of it. It's people around you that will be walking on eggshells because you're fused. So they are the ones. And because you may have hurt those people, they may have resentment inside their heart. And they're the ones that say, that's why it says that, let us not be many masters. Seek to become a, because in many things we offend all. He says you will come under greater condemnation. In other words, when you get into a position of leadership, there is opportunity for you as a person to offend a greater amount of people. And then you come under greater condemnation, which means men will make more pronouncements. That's why leadership is not, is not somewhere you just, because they will make pronouncements. They say, but if a man offend not in word, in other words, a perfect man. So it says one area you should don't in leadership offend. This is where people offend. The utterances that come out, the way you say and respond to people. That's what hurts people. And when people are hurt that way, they can go up. Have you not read that when Nebuchadnezzar ran into trouble, he went to meet Daniel and said, look at my dream. What is this about? Daniel said, these are the decrees of the watchers. What you have here, that you are soon going to collapse and your kingdom is going to be reduced and you are going to be among the beasts in the field, eating there, you that you are king. He says, it is by the decree of the watchers. This is by the word of certain people, which means people have been hurt and affected and they are making and they've pulled that kingdom down. And God says, all right, that's why I tell people that are in, in public office, right? It's very important that you understand you're in a place where there, there's a lot of condemnation. I mean, if, if you, look, I'm saying the truth. If you're a public officer and they give you money to go and you, you're supposed to do a road for people, funds have come to you. You don't do the road. There, there are craters there. People are driving. They enter into the crater. They die. And some children lost their parents because that road was not good and died. And in their tears, they pronounce. Whoever caused this death upon my father and brought this pain to my family, this pain shall not depart from them. Those things are weapons. Those things are weapons. Those words begin to, this is, this is the design. All right, this, those things are weapons. That's why when they came and, they, you know, people don't really understand it. You go to God and cry to him for justice. He shows up. Public office is not to oppress the poor. Public office is to lift people out. That's why when the righteous are in authority, which means it's to lift people, not to oppress them. In operating therefore under the lordship of Jesus, as I bring this to a close, number one, there are four things that will bring about fullness of life. And they all come from that word, given. But the first one is to give up or to give in to God in obedience. To give up, not in resignation, 
not in abandonment, but you give up that starting point and you surrender your will to him and accept that your self-rightness must be laid upon an altar. So you surrender, because before you can get in, you have to surrender and understand that when I come into any situation, I've surrendered my will to God to act in the way God wants me to act. All right? And this is how we stay under this blood covering that we release. Now, what you do is so that you can forgive. And the problem why people are not able to forgive is that they, they, there's still that self rightness there. After that self right, that they wronged me. I'm right. You are right. You may be right, you may be wrong. But to forgive so you release what you would have otherwise retained as a grudge, anger, or pain towards a person. Now, this doesn't mean that God is not a God of justice. Because it says, vengeance is mine. So the next thing is, you therefore give the situation over to God. If somebody is, did something and they're arrogant about it, give the situation over to God. That I will not hold any animosity inside my heart. I will not speak ill of this person. But God will resolve this matter. And it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So give the matter over to God. And place it in the hands of the creator and judge. So, for example, doesn't necessarily mean that what God is going to do is to go and punish that person. No, 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 no. I mean, God will sort that person out, guaranteed. But what God will do, for example, a lady told me once that a guy had just broken up with her. She was deeply hurt. She, she, she lived in Abuja. She used to watch us on television. And so she wrote me a testimony. And she heard me preach about forgiveness about two years ago. And she decided to release this gentleman and to let him go. And in doing that, you have, it's not that it's just for you, you have handed the matter over to God. And you have your own personal desires. You have removed everything. It's in God's hand. Because God has to still judge that matter. And in judging it, he comes in and does something in your own life that completely heals you. Because when you forgive, you may not be healed of that wound completely. But what God will do after you have forgiven will bring wholeness and wellness into your life. So she told me the story, and I'll close with this. And she said, she forgave this guy, prayed for him. She was a medical doctor. And then the thought just came to her. Why don't I apply for, she tried to go to the best medical school to do, to further in that particular specialty there. It was going to, the best medical school there she applied. And this was going to cost probably $80,000. It was Harvard Medical School. Well, to cut the long story short, she said, Pastor, I let go of him. These doors opened. I'm now going to Harvard Medical School to further this program with all expenses paid. She said, what he did doesn't mean anything because this is new life. She will meet somebody there, start a family. And she will look back and say, and she even say, said, do you know, holding on to him, I just cannot imagine what actually I was holding back from my own life just by holding on to him. In fact, when God shows up to, to correct that person of that particular thing, you will even have forgotten about it. 
when God comes to correct that person. I mean, the folks that treated Joseph, his brothers, the way they treated Joseph, they almost killed Joseph. In fact, they wanted to kill him. Then what, what can people do more than, worse than wanting your brothers to kill you and then to sell you to slavery? God didn't kill them. But God judged the matter. Made Joseph prime minister. Joseph and the brothers had to come to him and say, For he says, we are forgiving all that. Because oh, the way you treated me, by the time I released you, God showed up where I was and opened up powerful doors. Look at where I am today. You meant it for evil, but God turned it around for good. Unforgiveness will hinder what God wants to do. Forgiveness will open up the door. Father, I pray for every single person under the sound of my voice. This word came unto them, touching a particular area of their lives, something that they had just gone through, or something they had been wrestling with. And this word spoke to that. It's because you are set to do something unprecedented, and you need that door opened up through forgiveness. I pray that you grant them inner strength to forgive this moment to let go of that person or people and to let go of all of that. And as they do that, open up all the prison doors where others may have locked them, making pronouncements over their lives. Break open those prison doors, release them out of the clutches of men as they release others out of their own clutch and let them walk into a new season in this life where miracles will flow. And those who have stagnated because of offense, new lease of life comes to you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. Come to the end of this message. Believe you are blessed um, and touched by it. Walk in the light of forgiveness. There's so much power that is contained in it. I will give an opportunity for those who want to give. All right, there's a free will offering. What makes an offering powerful are seven things. One of them is that you give it with gladness of heart. And to do that is as you have purposed in your heart. So give. So it is something you have purposed inside your heart. You decide to give. All right. Another thing there is that it's not out of compulsion. It's a free will offering that you have chosen to give out of gladness. So if you want to give your free will offerings this morning here, whatever God has laid in your heart, that's the important thing. Nobody knows what it is. Whatever he has laid inside your heart to give, you decide to give that. I'd like to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every single person who has decided of their own free volition to give unto you. I ask in the name of Jesus, that you will cause grace to abound towards them, that other people around them also will come under this grace and freely give unto them as they have freely given, and that that grace will multiply that which they have given today as doors are opened up for more productive labor and greater platforms are opened up for them, for their gifts and for their talents to find fulfillment in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you for watching. It's always an honor to come into people's private spaces to preach the word of God. God bless you and you'll have a wonderful week in his presence in Jesus name. Amen. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us for church today. We believe that you have received the word from our senior pastor, Pastor Kojo Emade, straight from the throne of heaven to transform your life and answer the question that you might have in your heart. Um, we trust that as you're going forth into this week, you're gonna put into practice the word that you have received. Put the word of God on your lips. Transform your life around you by declaring the word that you have received um, and such that we all grow together into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for having church with us today. If this is your first time of um, fellowshipping with us, we would love to hear from you. So go to our website at www.insightforliving.org forward slash new 
to church and leave a message for us. Let us know how you're faring. Let us know that you're joining us for church. Just so you know, we're also going to have children's church right after this service. So be on the lookout so that your children can have church designed specially for them as well. God bless you. Thank you for worshiping with us. Have a lovely week.